Well, some people collect stamps and other people collect larger things. I had always collected weapons. I guess I kind of thought of buying something bigger. All stations, all stations, this is zero. Uh, we are live over the speakers. I say again, we are live over the speakers. Hey. Joining me in the stand now is Alan Duffy. We've got a lot of collectors here today that have ones and twos of vehicles, but I mentioned Alan before. He has entire battle groups, and he's been preserving not only Canadian history, but world history. He's rescued some of these vehicles from scrapyards and swamps and fields and done amazing work. But the key is that he also looks after the people. Also, everyone dressed like this, you go over to the gift shop and you can get one of those golf shirts, you know, with this embroidered here. It's a white one, it's a nice shirt, I bought it for you guys. The Gulf War has always fascinated me because of the potential threat and the way the world responded. So the ability to get a vehicle and, and track it down historically and find out a lot of information on it, um, that was always a real lure, you know, an attraction to me. When I get them, it could be, you know, as you know, 25 years after the conflict, and they could have undergone significant changes, been upgraded, modified, and what I'd actually do is to take the vehicle and take off those modifications and put it back to its original state. I don't think this thing has any particular way of going it on. It doesn't. No. Okay. Just it went on. in. It went in. And um, the markings that you see in the vehicles, they're exactly the way it was in the Gulf War, and I get those when I track down the veterans and the veterans give me photographs. Whatever way it was, I'll, I'll put them on crooked. If they had them on crooked and it was misaligned, I'll put it on exactly the same way they did. And he'd done a fantastic job of them. You couldn't tell the difference between now and 25 years ago. Like these vehicles that I'm looking at here, both of them, I have reacquainted the vehicles with the veterans that were the crew in these vehicles 25 years ago. All stations, all stations, this is three, three. Show. We're at the Aquino Tank Weekend, which is a celebration, and in particular this year, it's the 25th celebration of the Gulf War, and I took part in that operation. I was a commander of this particular vehicle, which is a striker guided weapons vehicle. I think it's very important because it, it's it's still recent history and it's living history. They can just come up and see the vehicles, touch them, talk to us, and we can give them a flavour of what it was like. Alan courteously invited us over um, to Aquino Day to crew the vehicles and to give the crowds an insight to what went on during the Gulf War. Them, we're sleeping them, we're heating them, we're fighting them, and it's a three-man crew. We're a family. We're a family of four, the vehicle and the three crewmen. So it's like when you see it, it's part of your family's come back to you. This vehicle is the exact vehicle that I was on in the Gulf, and um, I was invited over by Alan Duffy, which is an opportunity in a lifetime to come and see this old girl again. Yeah, it was quite emotional, actually, to come and see it exactly pretty much how we'd left it. Yeah, it's like seeing an old friend again. This particular one isn't mine. Mine, unfortunately, got blown up during the Gulf War. But this vehicle was uh, part of my troop. Unfortunately, none of the rest of the, that crew could be here today. The last time I saw the old girl was parking her on the docks in uh, Al Jabal docks in Saudi Arabia. Never thought I'd ever see it again. And to come back 25 years later to find her in absolutely perfect working condition, pretty much exactly the same livery and condition as I left it. Like we're in a time machine. That's what they say, like they're in a, because it looks identical, right? And here they are jumping in 25 years older into a vehicle that's, that they lived in for those several months. We have this uh, graffiti here, I don't know if you can get that. Out of pure boredom, you doodle and graffiti things and, you know, try and, I put the, the Grim Reaper on it and some fangs and everything, so I like to 
to make it a little bit more interesting. Yeah. It's, it's appeared in several publications of, of little pictures of it here and there. It's, actually, it's my one claim to fame, actually. You know, I do it. And, and you'll see it on this collection. I think a lot of trouble's been taken to try and replicate, you know, exactly what that graffiti was, because it brings to life, you know, the sort of personalisation of this whole thing. You look brilliant in your eye. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was brilliant. That was brilliant. That was Imagine. brilliant. It's often difficult for civilians to understand how you could live on such, what is potentially such a harsh vehicle. Well, this obviously, this is home. Six months is quite a long period to be living with the same guy. So you, it's like a little family. My wife at the time was pregnant, so, and I got this, my squadron was going out to the Gulf. So as it happens, he was two weeks overdue and uh, uh, he was born two days after I left. So I didn't see him until he was six months old. You can talk to each other about you know, if you're having a problem back home or, you know, your girlfriend's left you. So we knew everything, everything, little ins and outs of each other. You know, I used to cut their hair for them and, you know, and then you go home, uh, you leave it all behind. And I, I, I wanted to be back there. I lived on this vehicle for six months uh, out in the desert and thoroughly enjoyed myself. Because I know it looks like just uh, rubber and, st you know, steel, but... It, you know, you do get attached to this. I mean, this was our home for four months. Yeah, pretty, pretty we much. lived off this, provided everything. Yeah. One of the first things to remember, it was one of the hardest winters that they had uh, in the desert for about 40 years. So people thought we were going to be hot like it is today, but nothing like that at all. Most of the time, I remember being very, very cold, very, very wet. And in this vehicle, without a turret, the weather just comes straight in. It was really hot in the day, even hotter than today, and it's quite hot today, isn't it? And uh, in the night, it was freezing. Waking up at three o'clock in the morning and breaking the ice off your basher. So it was two climatic changes within 24 hour period. It's a lot of sand, you know, sand in your eyes, and sand in your teeth. And the reality sort of really kicked in when, you know, the, the negotiations failed and the air war started back in January. By this time, we'd moved right the way up to not too far from the Iraqi border into the staging areas. And you could hear the, the Ford artillery firing starting to shell the Iraqi positions and the jets coming over your head every night and all the lights going out and suddenly the afterburners kicking in. Minutes later, the horizon would erupt in a ball of fire and you could see the tracer flying up against the jets and, and everything coming back. Next thing you know, we were in the dark crossing through the breach and across the start line and, 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 it, and it all began. We were in quite a flat bit of desert and I stood up there and I looked around and it looked like literally a, a sea of vehicles and I, I just had this feeling, I'm thinking about it now, that what's going to stop this? And for the three days uh, I didn't sleep, I was uh, uh, adrenaline wired to the moon and basically stood up in that cupola for three days solid and uh, didn't even think about it. That was my first interaction of uh, combat, yes. Uh, obviously my family and friends were concerned as were everybody else's. You got some good memories, some bad memories from being in there, you know, some, some horrific memories as well. God knows how many prisoners. We didn't, they didn't even have to put up a fight, they threw their hands up. When we heard over the air that, you know, we were a ceasefire, you know, that you, we had kind of won, you know, we'd won at that point. It's, it's not as hard as what has been predicted. It's going to be a pushover because, unfortunately, you're talking on major nations with professional armies going against Saddam's army, which was three quarters conscripts who didn't want to be there. It was a good, clean war, very black and white. Everybody knew who the enemy was and what they'd done wrong. We dropped the vehicle off and literally just told her, leave it. And then very quickly, we were on, on a plane uh, back home. Yeah, it was a great feeling when we took off and uh, there was a big cheer went up as soon as we, uh, as soon as that plane took off. Everybody was just so happy. I remember coming home and seeing my dad, and my dad's quite a, a tough, robust Yorkshire farmer. And I remember him sort of like breaking down into tears and grabbing hold of me and sort of thing. And I was like, that, that was pretty emotional, that was, you know. And I think, you know, well, actually, and to see my, my dad like that, and, you know, he held my hand and he sort of like wouldn't let go, for, it felt like an eternity. We don't have anything like this in the UK. We don't, we don't remember things like this or, or celebrate what we've done. So this, is, this to us is something special. It's important that youngsters these days realise that actually warfare is not a funny business. It's a risky business. People die, people get injured, and it's not a nice thing to be engaged in. The, the person you'll find that uh, probably abhor war more than anybody else are soldiers. 
and you often find that soldiers uh, would do anything they can to avoid war because ultimately they're the ones who are going to have to put their lives on the line. A huge thank you to Al for giving us this opportunity to come back and be reunited with this old girl and see all our old friends and stuff. And You know, if it weren't for people like Alan Duff and Sorton and bringing this all together, you know, it wouldn't have happened. Ha 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 ha!